Hey everybody, I'm Spectacular, the Silver Stack. I'm here with Joe from Beantown's Coin. Over in St. Petersburg, Florida, Joe, how's it going? It's going great, man, this is exciting. Listen, you have a really, really cool shop here. This is a coin shop. It's got more than just coins, though. It's gonna take probably a little bit to go through this uh, coin shop here, but hopefully you got some time for us. Yeah, we've got 61 feet of showcase space in here, and it's pretty exciting. Well, hello, everybody. I seek to educate and entertain through my journey of collecting coins and stacking precious metals. I encourage you to subscribe and please stay with me on this journey. I am Spectacular, the Silver Stacular. So I figured I'd take a minute and introduce myself. A lot of you guys are going to know me already. I've been a dealer in the business for 15 years. I'm Joe Palmieri, my company is Beantown Coins, and we started in Boston. That's where Beantown comes from. Beantown is the nickname for Boston. So if you've never been to Boston, you don't know anything about that part of the country, you may not realize that's the connection. And I started in Boston for 15 years. I had uh, an office up there and then a second office down in Florida for the last several years. And just a few weeks ago, we closed both the offices down to open our first retail store. So this is the first time in all my years in this business that I've had a retail store and the public can come and find me whenever it works for them. You're pretty excited about that? Yeah, man, I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm thrilled. This That's is, cool. And it's got the new store energy, man. We are clean, organized, and we are full of all kinds of fun stuff. So um, what you'll discover is if you're used to coin stores, you'll often find coin stores that just, you know, they may not deal in that one thing that you're really into. And we aim here to have everything at our disposal. So if you deal in modern collectibles, if you deal in world coins, if you deal in US, high dollar US, or the low dollar US, if you deal in ancient coins, if you prefer bullion, but maybe you want fancy bullion, you don't want ordinary bullion, like we have everything in the world of coins and paper money. And then that's where I draw the line. If it's not numismatic in some way, we also do operate as a jewelry store, but you'll quickly discover we've got about six feet of jewelry and 56 feet of coins. So wow. we are a coin store first and foremost. I, learned, I started dealing in jewelry because I see the margins that jewelers charge and it can get pretty ridiculous. So um, we don't source our jewelry from wholesalers. We source it from people looking to sell their jewelry and then we put modest markups on it so that we can pass on really great deals. So if anybody's ever looking to you know, buy jewelry for your wife and you're already a coin person or that sort of jewelry for yourself, it's oftentimes much, much cheaper to come to a coin dealer who does jewelry rather than a jewelry store. Gotcha. Um, but it's not our focus, man. We are all about coins. So if you want to start over here. Yeah, man, show me around. Yeah, this is, there's so much to go through here. There is so much. If we don't get started, we'll never stop. So this is where the shipwreck stuff goes. I have to tell you, we just got back from a coin show and we had so much of our choice inventory out uh, to bring to the show. And we're just now, this is a day off for us. The one day we were closed, it's a Sunday. So we're putting, we have to put all the stuff back out. So while these pieces aren't actually out in the case yet, they're uh, back in the safe, but we'll be getting those out shortly. You know, this is original Casa de Moneda, 1836 on this particular piece. And I have two, how great is that? Holy smokes, huh? I know, right? So you've got these pieces right here, these shipwreck coins in the store. It's just, yeah. you haven't put them out yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. That. They were just oh. out of the show with us this weekend. Wow, all and, right. Uh, and so in fact, we also got this piece here. This is a 1715 fleet. And I'm only wearing it to showcase it. I have no attachment to it, and it is absolutely for sale. Uh, if you're watching this video sometime in the future, chances are most of what you see here today specifically will be gone, but it'll be replaced by other like stuff. Um, but this piece has this really awesome document that comes with it from Marine Treasures. This was written in 1975. And let's see if I can showcase this well on the camera. Wow, that's the piece right there. It's the got. piece on my neck. That's crazy. And look at that. They've even indicated where the different uh, spots are on the, on the piece so that you can attribute it and make sure you're talking about exactly the one in question. Oh, wow. How awesome is that? Are so, you willing to throw out a couple of prices? Uh, we can put prices out on I'm just kind of curious what that right there would be. Uh, well, this one, 1715 Fleet, uh, I'd probably price it around $2,000. Yeah. Yeah, and it wouldn't be... Uh, firm necessarily because I, I i have a passion for putting the right people with the right stuff and so there's times when i'm just really moved by how much someone wants something 
or you know what it would mean to them or how well it fits into their collection you know this is a we're a we were like hot couture for coins man i want a relationship with you i want you to be the kind of customer that we become friends over time and i know what you're into and i know what you collect so that when i'm out in the world shopping for stuff i'm, I'm thinking of you especially if you like a rare thing you may be one of not that many people who are that interested in that thing so to help you get that thing is a passion of mine i'm here to do this because this is what I do. This is what I've done every day. I mean, when I first discovered coins, I was late in life. I was a late bloomer. I was like almost 30 years old. And I first found out like, what's a rare coin? Could you imagine like that late in life? But as soon as I discovered what this hobby and then business is, I sold both my companies. I had two companies at the time. I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole life. And I went right into coins and nothing but this ever since. That's awesome. I finally found my home as a business maker in the business that I wouldn't ever sell. I just have no interest in selling this. I want to do this till I die. So I probably have another 40 years left in the business and I'm looking for 40 year relationships. That's cool. I don't know that there's like, you know, a specific uh, time frame you got to start collecting, but you know, anytime is good. It'd be better, I guess, if you were younger, you have a lot more time of your life to really learn about the hobby, but sure. Yeah, there's no, there's no right time, right? Yeah, I mean, you prove that. <laughs> right now, I mean, I, I'm helping. There, I have a customer right now who's in his 90s who's working on finishing his Morgan set. Now, so there's some guys that are, you know, at that stage of life looking to get out of all their coins and there's other people that want to hit it by the finish line, you know? Yeah, wow. The Morgan set, huh? Yeah. That's an expensive one. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> okay, okay. I see that, so right, right as you come in here, you got like more collectibles right as you come I in. I want to degree people with modern collectibles because they don't seem as common in a coin store and they're way more universal for people. If you walk into a coin store not as a coin collector already, you might find yourself connecting first with the things you recognize from around your life, like, you know, Marvel characters and DC Comics characters and Star Wars themed items and Sesame Street and, you know, things that are familiar to you. And what adds collectability to this type of market is the limited mintage. You know, the demand for these isn't as high as it is for numismatic coins, especially US numismatic coins, but the demand is more, far more than the production. So for example, this piece here, super popular, has a production of 250. That's it, 250 of these exist in the whole world. So if you saw this, fell in love with it, and went to go buy it, it's hard to find. And if you're the guy who's got one, when someone wants one later, you might be the only place they'll ever find it. That's it. Within a couple of years, most of these things, if they were successful and, and, and made in low numbers, are worth more. And so you can get appreciation on the numismatic collection just as strongly with modern collectibles as you can with, you know, the best of the U.S. numismatics. This stuff looks great, too. It, like, really pops mm. right when you come in. Is this a little squid game thing right there? What is that? It is, yeah. And the mintage on that was 456, which, if you liked the show, was his player number and the total number of players in the game. How cool is that, right? Yeah, and that's not very many, is it? No. Nope, that's two ounces of silver, and the umbrella actually detaches. <laughs> it's a two-piece coin. Wow. Just like in the show, right? Mm -hmm. The it comes out. Yeah. Yeah, this is great stuff. Now, this is a good idea right there, putting it in the, the front right there to wow people and give them some views of, oh, man, I love that show, or I love that series, or I love that thing, you know? This is great. Really, really cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So then we move from modern collectibles over into uh, more of the affordable U.S. numismatics. And we've got some stuff here that I was about to start to put out in this sure. case because we just got back from the show. And I thought I'd have a chance to highlight some things while I'm replacing this stuff. Highlight away, man. Let's see. You know, Joe, it's okay with you too. Sure. I want to put your information down below the video in the description Please. so people can check you out. And you're willing to ship some stuff out if somebody sees something, right? Absolutely. We ship everywhere uh, in the U.S. and we do ship to other countries. It just depends on the country. So, you know, please reach out and inquire if you're seeing this in a country other than the United States and find out if I ship to you. Gotcha. Okay. There's just a lot of risks in certain countries in shipping. And if people aren't going to get their stuff, you know, we shouldn't start trying. There's like different rulings on every single country too when it comes yeah. to shipping. It's, it's wild. Yeah, it really is specific. And... If you're a dealer who really would love to do that, I even help other people to understand how. Like, how do you manage, how do you get around international shipping? Who should you ship to and who shouldn't you, that sort of thing, I'm happy to help. One thing you guys will discover about me as you get to know me is that I love to teach and share all my knowledge. I don't think that there's a shortage of opportunity out there and we live in the information age, right? 
Coins are one of the few things left that just isn't fully digitized. You can't just Google what you want to learn about coins. And like doctors once had a monopoly on information, they no longer do. I'd like to see that happen for people. I think the world trades better and you know more transparently when the knowledge is ubiquitous. Right? Yeah. Everybody knows what there is to know and no one's hiding in the dark or hiding behind your lack of knowledge you don't get taken advantage of. So I am free with information. Share the knowledge. Yeah, the lessons are important. One don't die with it. Right, exactly. <laughs> if you've got something to teach someone else in this business, oh, look at these. So I've made a market for years in hobo nickels. There's the original hobo nickels and there's modern carvings. But what you want to keep your eye out for is just high quality work. If you look at these, there are certain artists, you can learn to recognize the artist by their style, the way they cut their lines, the way they dig into the coin, or even the subject matter that they do, you know, who does knights the most often. And if you're going to look for hobo nickels, you want to find something that's just a little bit more interesting than your typical just carved head. Or if you do have your typical carved head, you just want to make sure it's a really nice quality piece. Joe, am I free to touch some of these? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I've never seen the knight before. Oh yeah, they come a lot of ways. We've even got this flat top here that reminds me of Frankenstein. He just, he didn't add bolts in the neck that he could have. Never seen that one either. Fantastic. I'm kind of partial to that knight. I really like it. You always see the guy with the hat. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Of, and, and their subject matter isn't always heads. You know, and, uh, to, to be hobo nickels, they have to be carved on nickels and they have to be a head. And they're, then they're a hobo nickel. Okay. But there's love tokens in the category of carvings. And there's just other art. You know, there are carvers out there that carve on pennies and car or cents, to be more accurate. Carvers out there that carve on modern half dollars, you know, clad pieces. They'll carve on whatever cuts well. You know, what, what, how, you know, if you, I, I mean, a quick diatribe about hobo nickels for a second. These began with two guys that were actually bums named Bert and Bo. And they were riding the boxcars, being hobos, like for their life. And, um, they would take a, a buffalo nickel because they're really soft and they would take a nail because they could always find one and they would carve into the nickel and make some other design and then they would trade it for something more than five cents in value, like 10 cents worth of something as a way to really afford their lifestyle. So Bert and Bo were the original hobo carvers and there were other hobos that did carvings uh, but if they were done by actual hobos back in the day, then they're part of what's called the original hobo nickels. Um, then there's modern carvers, which is anything that isn't that. Yeah. And the modern carvers get into so much subject matter. Some of the best in the world can command $10,000 for a carving that they put on a Morgan dollar. How crazy is that, huh? Yeah, $10,000. But then we're talking fine art now. We've moved into this category of carvings that's fine art. And I have bought and sold some of those pieces. Notable artists are Naramantis Palsis, Alexei Sabarov. I'm giving those guys shout outs because their work is extraordinary and they deserve it. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, so now I just pulled those out because they were on top, but we're pulling out some US stuff now. And we have a lot of early copper in this store. We do a lot of colonials and things like that. That probably says something, has something to do with our origins in Boston. Um, there's a lot more copper in Boston, you know. It's been around since the beginnings of the nation. And the material that you can find up there is just a little bit more robust. So it goes that way, huh? Like different states seem to have more I don't know. In my humble opinion, I started in this business as a wholesaler and I would fly to all the major coin shows and all the regional coin shows and some of the minor coin shows. And I think at my peak in a year, I've done as many as, you know, 50 something shows in a single year. Um, in fact, I have a friend who's uh, breaking that record as we speak. I think he's on his 10th or 11th coin show of the year already. And today's the second week of February. <laughs> so he's, he's kicking butt right now. You gotta move, gotta move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've been going to coin shows all over the country, setting up there, trading mostly wholesale, and then, you know, some retail action. You know, that's how I started. And um, I had the opportunity to see the different markets all over America because of that. And I found that, you know, you'll find that Morgan dollars are more common out west and then copper is more common in the northeast. Really? Yeah. It's interesting. I think that's becoming less and less true than it was when I started years ago because, you know, the very nature of our world today, we're expanding and we're, you know, borders are dropping. People are having conversations live on the phone with someone, you know, on the opposite side of the planet. Video conversations, we're, we're making trades all day and night. You know, it's, it's an interconnected world now. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. Sure is. 
Oh, I see these little batarangs down here. Yeah, so, you know, it's just so many different things. There's a silver bullet there. We can get those in bulk for people if they want. There's, uh, oh, Spider-Man's hiding in the corner over there. The Lord of the Rings ring. How and crazy, then, huh? And when you get over to it on the left side, you'll notice that we have a wide variety of errors. And there's a lot of error collectors out there. And a lot of hype is given to um, catching varieties in your pocket. You know, especially on Lincoln Sense. Um, and I, I guess I just want to tell people to be careful pursuing that too actively because the demand for those pieces is, is lower than it would appear based on internet hype. Like if you actually do discover a Lincoln Sense variety from 2009, there's a, still a fairly good chance that it's not going to be super valuable. It'll be used, highly worn and used it may be one that, while there's not a lot of examples that are known, it doesn't mean that there's a lot of people who care. Yeah. You know, Joe, I've noticed that, like, uh, especially Yahoo News, you scroll their page, and just about every day there's some kind of, hey, check your coins or check your uh, pocket change for this modern quarter that could be worth $10,000. You see it all the time. And people yeah. freak out because they're like, oh, I have it. You now, know? I don't begrudge that misinformation because it brings people's attention to the existence of the coin market. You know, I have to deal with that I was 30 before I discovered that there were rare coins to collect. Yeah. You know, and I just don't want to see that happen to somebody else. Right. How many times do you think you're going to have uh, the person though, that comes in with that $10,000 coin allegedly? Well, you know why that can happen is because there's a lot of people who have $10,000 coins already. Oh. Ah. Right? And so if they bought one, they bought it at an auction where it's already been attributed, it's already been certified, and it's, you know, the best one. You know, maybe it's the highest graded example of that particular error. And that's why there is a... Uh, an article that says this coin could be worth $10,000 because one did sell for $10,000, but it was the greatest one that there is ever anywhere. And the that's one. why. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and so that one could very well walk in this store. You know, we're a national dealer. We deal an international dealer. So we deal with people all over the world. And if someone, you know, chose to get a quote from me or to, you know, entertain that with me, that could absolutely happen. Yeah. But it would be that one. It wouldn't be the one you found in your pocket. Most likely. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so how's, how's it been going? So, cause you've only been open really for a couple of weeks now, right? Yeah, it's been two weeks. So we had our grand opening on January 27th. It was packed in here. We've got some glamour shots of that because we had a photographer here to capture the, the That's day. That's cool. You know, cause that day will, you know, be the day forever. It's like the day you get married, right? Sure. The day our store opened and I want this store to be here for a very, very long time. So we got some photographs of it. We took some video and, uh. And, uh, it was it was slamming, but it's only been two weeks, and that's you know it's been so it's been busy enough in here that it really made a lot of sense for us to have you come in on our day off. What do you think so far from the customers you've had? Like, is the most common thing that they want? The most common thing that they want. Oh, yeah. Man, what type of coin? I guess if I dealt with only one thing, that would be an easier answer, right? Really? Yeah, because I would be inherently narrowing that down in my own mind without realizing it. Like if I only dealt in U.S. and then you said, what's the thing people want? I would only give you the answer that was a U.S. coin, mm -hmm. right? But because I deal in everything, you know, that answer is different. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot more people come to see me for what they can't find elsewhere. They have a good relationship with a coin dealer already. He's been serving them in their U.S. needs for years. They have no intention of, of changing or ending that relationship. So, but they also want something he just can't find out. Gotcha. You know, they want other things. They want another relationship. They want a second opinion, just like you would from your doctor, right? Coin dealing is a lot like being a doctor in that the person who wants the thing can't really know all that we know. You know, without doing this every day of your life for decades, you can't know as much as the guy that you're interacting with who has done it every day of his life for decades. And so you have to do it like the way you choose your doctor. You study the doctor, you look up his accolades, you interview his patients, you figure out, is this the guy for you? You get to know his personality. And then once you do choose your doctor, you have to trust him. Gotcha. What else can you do? Because you just don't know what they know. Right. And it's sort of like that for coins. But the right coin dealer, just like the right doctor, would teach you as you're learning, especially if it's applicable to you, right? If you get a diagnosis, then the doctor's responsibility, I think, ethically, is to teach you about your, your, your new situation. Same thing with a coin dealer. If you tell me you're suddenly interested in something that you didn't know before, it's up to me to teach you so that you can interact with that collection in a way that's most appropriate for you. I'm gonna to try to save you some pitfalls, I'm gonna help you make money, because 40 years from now, when you go to sell your collection that you've made in your lifetime, or 10 or 20 or 30 or whenever, you're gonna remember the guy that took care of you who's gonna make sure that you made money. 
This hobby, you can make money. You should make money doing this. I don't know any other hobby. If you want to ski or play badminton or table tennis or even pickleball, you're going to spend money, right? You're going to spend money to play that hobby. Here, you're spending money, but what you have appreciates as long as you're buying the right things. And right. that's where you need help. Yep. I see a lot of young people out there um, and they're making a lot of money on their hobby right here. It's kind of interesting to me. Oh, I can tell you, I've had a few protégés over the years. And in that time, um, a lot of them have been young, you know, a lot of kids. I think, you know, I've, I've helped some kids start as early as, you know, 10. Usually before that, their parents are guiding the ship. You know, their parents, you know, they're kind of pushing it. But by the time a kid's 10 years old, there's a lot of times that he's, he's already, you know, he knows what he wants more than his parents. He's got his own money even, you know, it depends. But I've known a, a, a couple of kids who took their bar mitzvah money when they were 13 or whatever, you know, they accumulated by the time they were 12 or 13 years old. And then they have a good relationship with some dealers. Dealers are really generous with kids, you know? We wanna help that generation come in. So the savvy kids are just getting as much help as is offered and it's a lot. And they'll buy and sell and trade and maybe they'll get a little bit sweetheart pricing on things in both directions. and. In the process, uh, I've known some of those same kids that by the time they're 20 years old, they've got $100,000 in value. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, just from this hobby. And so now they're a 20-something-year-old starting out with $100,000. You know, in today's world where kids can't even buy a house, you know, you can't, you have to make it to your whatever. I don't even know. You can be a millennial in their 30s and 40s now and still have not had the right economy to be able to have that simple part of the American dream. So um, I think that this is a way. This is a way that people can turn their lives around because, you know, if you spend all your money on money, you'll always have money. Yeah. You're always broke, but you'll always have money. How's, right. how's well, that? It just huh? depends on how much you love your stuff. And that's, you know, that's a sense of discipline. But you know what I found too, is that the more stuff you see, the less attachment to it you have. You yeah. know, things become mm -hmm. less rare for you personally. So how about, how's that with you? Like as a, uh, a coin shop owner, are you finding yourself not getting attached? I see that you have the necklace on that you're wearing for right now, but you said you'd be willing to sell that. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I, I'm blessed in that I didn't find this hobby because I'm a, a collector already. I wasn't already a collector in my life. I'm more of a merchant. I've always had a merchant's heart. I've been a trader throughout my life. I love the idea of dealing, whether it's buying or selling and trading and, and, and serving people by connecting the thing with the wanter of the right. thing and like that. And that's... Um, and so when I found this, I was like, this is the greatest thing. You know, the greatest things are here to me. Um, I also, as a hobby, I sculpt. So my appreciation for the three-dimensional art is there. And coins are all three-dimension. They're bass relief. You know, you're, you've got three dimensions here to consider. And then you've got the fourth dimension of surface itself, which is something that you don't always have to consider in other types of three-dimensional art, like digital three-dimensional art, for example. But here you've got surface, and the surface changes everything, too. So you've fallen in love with helping people, not so much yeah. keeping the thing. Well, I still have fallen in love with the stuff, right? But I guess I get my ego from having owned it. Yeah. You know, rather than still having it. I can see that, Because yeah. we all, we all want to, you know, feel good about what we've accomplished. And in this business, there's a lot to feel good about. And if you've achieved the possession of some extraordinary coins, whether you still have them or don't, it's, it's extraordinary that you did, even for a moment, a, a, a coin you can tell a tale out. You know, I've had a... I've had a coin that there were three known. You know, there were 12 minted by the US man, a particular date proof quarter eagle. Um, and the, the piece ultimately made it into the hands of the, the Hansen collection because he's going to be training, he's aiming to be the next Elias bird, right? And complete the whole US thing. So, you know, it was really great for an opportunity to help that dream be possible by having had that coin, even if it was only for a week. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I had not uh, really considered that early on in my collecting game. I was kind of more like, oh, I'm going to die with this. But then I heard somebody say, like, you know, I had the coin for a few months and then I pass it along. You know, it was like yeah. a very expensive coin. And I can kind of see that. I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool, though, because you have the story that I touched that coin once. Yeah. I'm part so, of that coin's history now. Yes, you still get the satisfaction of having experienced possession. I yes. ownership. Like, it was yours, man. Yeah. It was yours. That rarest thing that only seven people have owned or ten or whatever mm -hmm. in the whole history of its existence. And you got what? You, you were one of them. And, but then you can use the money for another game. Yeah. You know? yeah. And you, you pass the hobby along. Back. Yeah. That was a great coin. Let somebody else enjoy it, too. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think that trading is the heart of coin. I'm, more, I'm really way more a coin trader than a coin collector. I want to see it flow, man. I want to see people happy and joy. And joy comes from the new, whether it's a new purchase or a new sale to allow for the new purchase. Gotcha. 
That's good, Joe. Yeah, and I don't really, so I don't get attached to this stuff. And if I do, I just get attached for a little while. I don't want to compete with my customers. I'm gonna try better on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do better to not get attached forever. <laughs> well, you know, I, I kind of feel like this. If I'm if I'm actively collecting, like really collecting, right? And so are my customers. Then what am I not selling them? Like what's not available for them? The things that I want for me. Right. So then I'm inherently putting myself in front of all of them, which most coin dealers do. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I don't begrudge them that, right? Because you know we all got to take care of ourselves and our family as much as we want to be generous with the world. I think I'm just blessed in that I don't have an attachment to stuff. I'm kind of a minimalist, you know, in life in That's general. Good. I just don't need a lot of things around me. And yet here I am with more individual items than most humans will ever have. Right. Some of the greatest people in, uh, in this world right here were minimalists, right? Yeah. Look at Elon Musk right now. Sold all his houses because he just wants to work. Right. He wants to focus. Right. If you don't need a house, you don't need a house. <laughs> So let's see if I can pull some of these slabs out. Because... We get some slabs now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just pulled some. We're gonna get around, by the way, everybody, to the entire shop because this thing snakes around. It has all kinds of different items. So don't go away. There's gonna be a lot in here. Yeah, there's so much more coming. In fact, I'm gonna get into US now because I really want to get people who, but the things that I know that probably the majority of your viewers are interested in. And Joe, course... this seems like a lot of work, man. It is. Everything I do is a lot of work. I'm not going to point out every coin that I have one at a time, but as I put them out like this, you know, we're just tossing things. Ooh, the 1921. Nice. You know, and I try to get things in all the price points too, because, you know, you might want the best one that you can afford, but I don't know what you can afford until we meet. Right? And the, uh, the example for some people is the lowest quality condition that they can find of that thing. That's the only way that they can, uh, they can do it. Joe, how does it work if I say, you know, Joe, I want this 1921D 50 cent, it's unfair mm -hmm. to, how do we, how do we come to an agreement on the price? How, where, where do we start? I mean, essentially I do negotiate at shows at the store. I just look at my retail price tag on it and I knock something off. Okay. You know, whatever it is that I know I'm comfortable with at shows. Sometimes I have to be really intense because there's a lot of other people and I still want to be the one to serve you, you gotcha. know, and I know that there's 17 other options. Here in the store, it's got a, I got a lot of overhead. I got to cover this stuff. So the way in which I've managed that so far is to have pricing be a little bit different based on where you find me. So you've already got pretty much your personal price guide based on what you had to pay for this thing. Yeah, that's okay. the thing. But I, I, you know, when you deal in stuff long enough, you just know. I know. I just know what people, you know, typically pay retail for this particular piece, and then I know what. Uh, I can afford to buy it for and make a margin that's appropriate. Gotcha. And so like this one, for example, my retail price on you'll see is $245. Yep. And you know, depending on whether I'm here or at a show, you know, here in the store, um, uh, I'm limited by the laws of the locality as well in a way where if I'm traveling to another show, the laws in that locality are different. So that can change things like the sales tax that I have to charge. Um, but anyway, I would probably, if you wanted to buy this coin for me right now, Jesse, you'd probably get it for uh, two twenty. Nice, which is a significant discount. You should pay ten percent if I can get there. Key date coin right there. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and that coin will probably be going when you watch this video. But I would suggest you call me to find out. You know, I, <clears throat> I do want to say that too. That people can call you again. I'll have your information down in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. um, just because you see that coin on this video does not mean that it still exists in the shop because people call all the time when I do these coin shop interviews and uh, they grab these coins, but don't stop that from calling and seeing if that coin is, or one like it is available because it, it might have a, a brother or sister that walks in. Well, that's just it. And as I get to know you and you tell me what it is that you're looking for, we keep a master want list. And the master want list just tells me who I'm supposed to call when that thing shows up. And this way I can serve my customers first and foremost. So- Joe, Joe I gotta see this one. Yeah, pull it, man. Whew. Goodness gracious. So we do toning. I, I've made a market in monster toners over the course of my career. And I'm gonna highlight a couple of here. Common date, but that toning is not common, sir. No, this is uncommon toning, Let me see. sir. Wow, look at the rainbow, huh? It's starting to look like a triple rainbow. Yeah, there's scales to this. There's degrees to everything. And toning is a really difficult thing. So if you decide that you love toning, you can't just get help from anybody, guys. I'm just I'm telling you that straight up. There's so few people who know how to recognize artificial from natural toning and who know how to look at a coin and tell you what sort of factorial that it would add to the value. You know, anyone can look at this coin in white 
and figure out what gray sheet is or what PCGS price guide is or what red book says or you know what auction levels are going for i can even troll on ebay and figure out like you know what should i pay for a white one of these but once you have color in the mix it takes a pro to know ah, that adds about 400 bucks no no that one only adds about 200 and it becomes a feel you know when people want me to teach them that what i do to teach them that is i expose them to as much color as i can and show them records that are moving yeah because <clears throat> then you can get a sense where when it looks like this it's worth that much so to give you guys a sense i have this out at 1875 i'd have a little bit of flexibility usually i try to get up to 10 percent if i can gotcha but this it's is at one thousand eight hundred and seventy five dollars and it's significantly more than it would be if it were a white coin yep it's just this is part of the hobby it's so awesome because it has all these layers you know oh you're just a guy that collects nothing but you know the key dates or whatever what about the key dates with the toning you know like it's just yeah <laughs> and that's and that's trickier than you'd think right because there's a lot of people who don't like toning or they could never afford it with toning so they want their key dates without toning yeah. so if you have a toned one they're they're priced out even if they like it more or they may not even like it more some beauties in here man yeah, check this out this is a more affordable world that's toning on a franklin you don't usually see attractive toning on a franklin if you do sometimes like it's been known to happen that's pretty. Yeah, usually you just, you just don't see that. You're right. And they knew it too because they ended up, uh, you know, getting the thing holdered backwards. Exactly. Cool. See, that's something else that you can ask for too when you're dealing with PCGS or NGC is you can request to have something reverse holdered. Yeah. And that's important in that kind of a circumstance. So I'm going to leave this out right now since we're closed today. I don't have to worry about security so much. I'll sure. lead you guys around the store to another area. Another area? Yeah. I see like a little foreign tray here. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, so this is the, yeah. These are, so these guys are priced at a dollar a piece or uh, seven for five dollars, 16 for ten dollars. And um, I don't, I sell, you know, foreign by the pound sometimes, but my prices are higher than most people are used to because I do not pull. You know, I, if, if something has to be worth, gosh, more than $10 for me to pull it, but mostly I don't even sort because I know that the joy of this stuff is the find and the hunt. And I don't want to take that from people. You know, if I go through all my poundage first, you guys don't stand a chance. Right. So I don't. So you're not cherry picking. I don't. No, I don't. I pull it out and I keep boxes of it down low in case it gets, you know, empty. I just I have some more than when it comes in, I just toss it in a box and I don't give it my attention, you know, whatsoever. But now if somebody is flipping through in front of me and my eyes catch a thing, I'm not, you know, there's a certain point where it's like, I'm just not foolish. Like I look at bam, that's $27. And I just caught it in the corner of my eye. I'm going to be, all right, that's going to flip and going out in the case. But that's all the more reason for you guys to come and check my poundage out on a regular basis. If you're anywhere in within two hours of St. Petersburg, I'd say it's worth the trip here. Right and on. if you're coming to St. Petersburg or St. Pete Beach for vacation or something, then make sure you stop in and see us while you're in town. Right on. And if you're not coming to St. Pete for vacation, come to St. Pete for vacation. It's <laughs> pretty awesome. What is there to do here? Oh, and St. Pete Beach is one of the best beaches in the country. Yeah. Yeah, the sand is white, the water's warm, we're on the Gulf. And, uh, you know, it's got all the beach town energy. This place is booming right now, Joe. Yeah. This yeah. place is booming. Yeah, it is. And, and the store itself is so busy during the week that, like, we got to get you guys in here on an off day like this. It's just what I have, you know. Well, again, I wouldn't you know. have the time. And now, now, if you were coming in, if you got some patience, I spread my time freely. There's other people. At the moment, I'm by myself, but I'm not by myself every day. So there's, there's help here, and, you know, I'm here for you guys. There's awesome. a lot of other people to do the other stuff so that I can just be here for you. Definitely appreciate the opportunity to come see you and check out your shop. Yeah, we keep shipwreck coins and bezels already for people. People love these things. Yeah, you know, and, and so often do people call me up and ask me to put shipwreck coins and bezels for them that I just, I just do it now. They're already ready. Ready to ready. And I, and I like to keep some uh, smaller ones too because I found that women, for example, don't want to you know, wear a big clunky real or it's even some men that just feel like it's too ostentatious, a little too big for them. So if you only have eight real shipwreck stuff, then you're still cutting people out. 
I only do eight escudos, no big deal. You know what I mean? I'm kind of a big thing. Eight escudos, <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's it, man. But that's that, that's cool. And eight escudo shipwreck stuff, you're in the five figures. You're getting some, some it depends on the wreck, right? It yeah. depends on the condition of the piece. Well, seven, yeah. 17, 15, I mean, yeah, you're definitely Yeah, big you're in some real money there, shoot. you know? That's Speaking of mean. things to do in Florida, I mean, shoot, people can go to the beaches and try to comb for some gold coins and stuff that wash up every I now mean, and that's and just it, you know? Some <laughs> of the best wrecks that have happened in you know, near America have happened around Florida. Yep. You know, that's why people love the legend, uh, you know, they talk about the story of Atocha, for example. There's the Cuban Waters one, too, which is right off of Florida, guys. You know, Cuba's not far. Mm -hmm. um, so... A lot of history here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me just finish this guy. Sure. And we'll Take your time. In this case, we're going to do a world now. Let me pull a box of world coins out for you guys, and I can put those back. So I have to hope that uh, my world viewers are watching. Hey, and if you're not, then you might learn something new. Right, you still might enjoy yourselves. I wasn't at first, Joe. At the beginning, I was like, I'm just gonna do US, that's all I'm gonna focus on. And then I started getting my first foreign pieces, and I was like, man, these things are really, really cool. And you can start to tell that, you know, the US coins have, uh, basically are stealing designs and ideas from other countries, yes. uh, especially Mexico. I mean, we took a lot of uh, Spanish uh, influence when we were making our coinage. Absolutely true. So a lot of people are familiar with the El Cazador shipwreck, but what they don't know is how much harder the four real is to find than the eight real. So the smaller ones are harder, huh? Oh, in this case, it just depends. Like how many pieces were in that wreck and what sizes were they, right? Isn't that, it kind of tells you what there's more of or less of. So, but you'll just find out in the marketplace, the four reals in this case are harder to find. These are Cuban waters. Shipwreck, you know, Cuban water shipwreck. These are two certified examples. The ones that I had certs on in the beginning of the video are not certified. Well, sorry, they're certified, they're not graded. Gotcha. These are graded, those are certified and graded. Super cool, man. Way awesome. Yeah, much tougher shipwreck to find than most. Shoot. Now here's a fun little thing. I'm just gonna put this out here. There's another category of coins called fantasies. Fantasy coins. Yeah, fantasy coins are coins that weren't actually ever issued for circulation. And, you know, it depends on who made them, but they were made as if, like to be coins, right? Okay. So let's give you an example. Of Is that kind of like a pattern coin sort of, I mean, ish? It could be, yeah, but a pattern coin was officially sanctioned by the mint in question, like the U.S. Mint, for example, gotcha. as in a, a shot at seeing if this design would work, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas these are examples here of fantasy pieces in that, you know, Edward the Eighth wasn't actually featured on coinage. Well, there's a couple of, you know, rare examples and they're very, very expensive, but there's very, very little that had him on it. And so uh, someone made a fantasy piece, this one struck in copper nickel, it's written right on there, right? Of what it would look like if Sierra Leone had made a piece with him on it. So because it's like something that doesn't truly exist really, I mean, it's it, a that, fantasy. even though it's like that, it's not too expensive, I saw. No, 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 no it's not expensive at all. Oh, okay. So it's an opportunity to own something that's, you know, it's not a real coin. It's yeah. not, it's not a real coin, guys. Sure. And yet, we never had that coin. That coin never got to be. Right. So that's what makes it a fantasy. This is a real coin. This only 300 were made in 1952, and it's called the Europa Five Europinos. Hmm. And it's the precursor to the euro. It was really the idea of one Europe. And at, the, some, at its earliest inception, around 1952, this was actually struck in the mints in Germany after the war, um, but significantly after the war, 1952. But Very five cool. Europinos, and it's super not expensive because the demand for this piece isn't really, really high. Wow. 300 exists in the world, and for $300, I'm selling it. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, and that's what you, you don't find that in US as readily. Right, because there's such a strong demand already for U.S. coins that the opportunity for you to um, find something that's scarce that isn't yet in demand doesn't is, is not much. If there's only a few of them, if there's only 300 of a U.S. coin, it's already wanted by a lot of people. But in world, you get the chance to, and, and in ancients and other places, you get the chance to meet the demand before it gets there. You know, demand has risen for coins as population rises. It's gone up year after year since the dawn of time. People were collecting coins. Romans collected Greek coins. You know, like we've been collecting coins. It's the, it's the hobby of kings. It's the oldest hobby. And it's the one you can get paid to play. Yeah. So just get deeper and deeper your whole life. I promise it'll be okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a good time.
Everybody, I mean, as, as soon as I meet somebody, they, you know, I make a friend or whatever, and they find out that I'm a coin collector, the first thing they think, Joe, is I'm some kind of coin nerd. They always think nerd, oh, yeah. right? And I'm well, thinking yeah, like- listen, nerds are popular now. Nerds are big deals now, yeah. yeah the nerds something. of the world are the most uh, influential people now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'll wear the, uh, you could call me a nerd, I'll wear that moniker yeah. with pride now. It's all right now, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah you're right. I'm in love with this one. I've, I've found, fallen in love, Joe. I thought I, thought I was going to change my ways. It's a shipwreck cop. No, you won't. You won't. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you more. In fact, that's the game I want to play. This is a rare Panamanian quarter Balboa. This is a very popular piece from the Philippines because it's got MacArthur on it. You know, there's one other piece with MacArthur on it from 1980 where he looks so much more badass. He's got bomber glasses on and the leather jacket kind of a look to him. And it's like, I don't have one at the moment. Whenever I get them, I buy them and they, they go quick. Um, but keep your eyes out there for a 1980. You could probably just Google search 1980 Philippines MacArthur and, uh, and you'll find the piece. A lot of Balboa fans out there on my channel. I know that for a fact. Yes, absolutely. Let's pull some attention now. And there could be a lot of Cuban fans out there too. And we've got some pretty extraordinary Cuban pieces. This is the finest known of that type or finest graded. Cuban coins are tough because certain places won't sell them. Yep. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I love Cuban currency. Yeah, we don't, have to, we don't get into that kind of politics here, man. If it's a coin, it's for sale. And, and, and you know, to people having to interact with that with, let's say, Third Reich coinage, you know, I, I, I often have to interact with people's sensitivities to that, you know, part of world history. And um, my only real response to that is atrocities are happening today, you know, right now around us. They're happening in... You know, they're happening in America as much as they're happening in other countries too. So, you know, we have to, I guess, as a principle, put our attention on that which, you know, makes the difference. Yeah. And for me, this is my niche in the world and how I'm here to serve. And I'm not gonna filter the material for the world like that. But in sense of balance, I don't display actively Nazi coinage. Sure. So I have it, people can come and request it, and then they will be able to buy it and I will not censor that as a trade. Um, and my mother's Jewish, right? So like there's a whole world of people that could say that I'm being anti-Semitic and that I'm not, I love everybody and everybody's hurting everybody else already. Since the dawn of time, Joe, Yeah. since the dawn of time. Very popular ABC Peso, Jose Marti, another Cuban example. Well, this is Cuban stuff I've never seen before. Well, there you go. Most people are familiar with the star Peso. Yeah, big time. Yeah, that's the most popular one. And there's more of them, but there's so much stuff. Like here, here's a rare piece. And who would even know to want it, right? 1966 Burundi, a silver 1,000 franc. And uh, where's the mintage? 16,000 is the total <clears throat> mintage. And PC population is one in 65. Wow. And this is a PL66, finest known. NGC has five with one higher. Finest known. Well, right? oh, no, there's one higher in NGC, but you know, this is this is finer than anything at PCGS. Proof line 66. Yeah. And it's it, got some beautiful color on it. Yeah, too. and it's a low mintage coin. It's got some great color and toning. I don't even, I don't have the angle, but I don't know whatever angle yeah. is going to catch that. Please, yeah, you do. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. Super common coin, super uncommon date below here. Yes. I've seen this coin before. Yeah. But that's a much harder date to find. Ah. People see, here's another, people see Panama Balboas all the time, but there are dates that are much harder to get than others. 1934 is a better date. I love the Balboas so much. <laughs> Such a great looking piece. At this point, I'm just cherry, oh, here's a, let's got even older. Have you guys seen that Balboa? Look how neat that is, huh? Mm-hmm. Got a knight in shining armor on it. Beautiful. Check this out. This is a proof from 1977. The mintage is 150 for the world. Only 150. Yep. Then turn it over and give people an idea about how much one of 150 in existence. And that's a true coin minted by a country, and I have it out at 395. Let's see. Yeah. 395. So for $400, you get to own one of only 150 in the world that existed, an actual coin for an actual nation. And if you're trying to collect all the countries, that's a fun game that really intricate coin. Uh, world coin collectors get into is they just want to have one thing from every country and then they play the game of one thing from every country that's ever been because there are countries that are no longer extant like uh, Tanutuva which existed for a very short period of time uh, 
in the, the and then was absorbed into the USSR during its expansion in the 1920s. That'd be cool. Yeah. Collecting countries that no longer exist. Yeah, there's a whole world of that. In fact, I've got a customer who's actively right now looking for all the, you know, non-extant countries, extinct countries. Yeah, so there's, there's just so, and I didn't highlight this, but Danish West Indies is hard as just as a country. People love this stuff. This is, I highlighted it because I know there's someone out there watching this that's like, oh my goodness. He so, has it. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to make sure that it was seen on there because that's an example where the piece could be harder than the, the collector could be harder than the piece. Sure. This is um, a, a pattern. This is like a, they call it a specimen. Mm -hmm. But everybody who's familiar with this late date, 1975 peso from Argentina, the reverse is different. That is not the typical reverse that one is supposed to see when you turn over that coin. So we got a pattern coin here. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's fun. Neat. Let's see anything else I want to play here. Let's do some ancient stuff. Where'd you find all this stuff, Joe? Uh, coin shows. <laughs> coin shows and my customers, because I've built up so many customers by serving them for years that people who've locked away all kinds of fun and exciting stuff are going to bring it back to me. Yeah. This is where it's going to come. This is it. Yeah. And That's at the cool. shows all over the country, I buy and sell. I've got great relationships with all the best dealers, especially in the world and ancients. They're a smaller market. There's less of us. You know, there's only so many of us that deal in ancients and UN and, and, uh, and world. So if you're... You know, if you're a collector out, you know, in the middle of the country somewhere and you just don't have a dealer anywhere near you who's dealing in the stuff that you want to collect, you know, you can reach out to us. I'm happy to, you know, use video and pictures and um, with my known customers that I've had for many years, I even send them coins um, sight on scene, like on approval. And they get the coin, they look at it, they have it in their hands and they say, you know what, Joe, it's not quite what I'm looking for. They send it back or they pay me. Awesome. You know, but that kind of relationship can be built up over time with people that I know and trust. And I think people today are looking for that kind of relationship. Yeah. You know, they want their, their coin dealer to be their friend. They want it to be someone that their mutual trust has been established by years of, you know, collaborating. Well, obviously you and I are just getting to know each other, but I have definitely built those relationships with my local people too uh, over the years. And I can go in now and before I even say like, hey, how are you? They, they, they turn around, they grab something from a shelf and they go, hey, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> huh? I know you like those, you know? Because we already know what you like. That's the thing. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be fun. I want people, if anybody's old enough to remember the show, Cheers. There's a character, Norm, would walk in the show and everyone would go, Norm! As soon as he walked in, like the whole bar would erupt yeah. with his name as soon as he walked in. And I want that experience for people when they come here. I want you guys to, if, if you want that, I want, the, I want it to be like that you're known and you're welcomed and we're excited that you came whenever you get here. That's cool. <clears throat> That's what we want as customers. I mean, yeah, we like that. Here's a Cuban piece. This was from the Pittman collection. Proof, five cents. I can't get that one. Let me, let me grab that one. And, and, you know, raise your hand if you've never seen a proof Cuban coin. Mm. Most people can't have to raise mm. their hand to that I'm one. I'm thinking I have it. Sure. That's awesome, isn't it? And it was from the Pittman collection. So if you guys know anything about pedigree, Pittman put together a pretty amazing collection, much of which was sold fairly recently, actually. This is a Bolivian 8 real, Min State. 1700s, it's for the more discerning collector with a big budget. Are you sending uh, coins off to get graded for customers or are you not yeah, into that? Yeah, absolutely. You do that too? I do that for myself, I do it for my customers. I use all the grading houses because there are some coins that are better served by being in some holders. Okay. It doesn't matter whether that's NGC, PCGS, Annex. You can give that advice to people. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. I'll give them counsel on that and I'll facilitate it for them if it makes a difference because we're already shipping out coins to the grading houses on a regular basis. You know, it's just part of, it's the way, it's part of the operating procedures of a group coin store because, you know, people need the liquidity that comes from faith in another company than the person they're dealing with. And even if you've got beautiful faith in me, then once you've bought the coin, if you want to trade it with anybody else, it's not faith in me that you're passing along, right? right? It's faith in something else. So that's where these come in because the faith is in PCGS to have graded this correctly. And it's actually part of my job is to catch their errors, right? So in PCGS, overgrades something, at the very least, I'm going to point it out to a customer and say, I have this price as a 63, even though it's in a 64, because I do not believe it's a 64. That's fair. And now at that point, I'm also careful with it because it's, it's ethically, it's a questionable thing because now they have the opportunity to sell it as a 64 out in the world because it's represented as a 64. People would even argue with me that it is a 64 because they said it is like the umpire in baseball, right? It's a strike because they said it's a strike. I don't, 
I have to be careful with that. I never sell counterfeits or fakes, not even to people who collect counterfeits and fakes. I'm sorry, that's the why. Because to me, I have to have faith that that coin never gets back out there and used for, for harm. Yes. So I keep all of the fakes that cross my path that I own. If I don't own it, I can't keep your fake, right? You could choose to donate it to the fires, but I plan on keeping all of it as teaching tools for as long as I can. And there are specific instructions that it be destroyed upon my demise and I'll do it myself when I get old. I do I the want, same I thing. See them destroyed. I do the same thing. People send me uh, fakes all the time as like educational tools. And uh, I, I tell them right off the bat, I'm not giving the coin back. Just so you know, if you ship this to me, it's not going back. Yeah. And uh, I think every single time everybody's like, no, they totally understand. They're, they're okay with it. Yeah. They want to inform others. And it, but that takes a real faith in your dealer too, because you know, an unscrupulous dealer could tell you something's fake that isn't and then try to steal it from you. So 100%. it's another one of those doctor moments where you got to just know who you're talking to and who you're dealing with and what their integrity is and whether you can trust them. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, funny story. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody sent me, because they have uh, one of those Sigma Metalytics machines, right? Those are great. They're and they, I guess they put their silver bars on there and they were showing up as being counterfeit on their end, right? They were showing off to the right or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be, sure. but not legit. And so they're like, can I send you these bars for education? I said, sure. Um, every single one is real. And mm -hmm. he sent me like, I don't know, $700 worth of silver. And so I had to message him. I'm like, hey, this is all legit. I got to send this back to you. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and then, and sometimes it's user error. You know, sometimes it's environmental. You know, there are great places to you know get further training and how to use your Sigma properly or which one you have. And but I have I have known them to make a mistake or two over the years. So nothing really beats the expertise of a pro. You know, and someone at a coin shop uh, that's a pro will going to have all the tools at their disposal. Right on. You know, they'll have an XRF gun, maybe they'll have a Sigma, they'll have, you know key tester, like all the different ways in which they'll have their own personal years of experience. You know, we can, when you've been trading in, let's say, US gold for enough years, you just know color. Gold has a certain color to it and the color can be just a little bit off and you're like, that's not gold. It's yeah. not real, it's not right. Get an eye for it. Yeah. Speaking of get an eye for it, Joe, I, I peeked over here while we were talking mm -hmm. and I saw these uh, Japanese pieces. Yeah, those are Japanese Ichibu. I call them samurai money. Um, they're at the end of the feudal era in Japan, uh, mid 1800s. There's a couple of eras you can get tempo era or ansei, um, but essentially they're not exactly dated. Uh, there are varieties that allow you to narrow the date range down a little bit, but they're pretty much marked by ruler. So the cool thing about them is that they're uh, most of those are all a year onk. They were preserved in really high condition in large groups. So they're just an available thing in Japan, not so available here in America. And I uh, often wholesale them to dealers because I have a connection where I can get the ones that I, you know, authenticated. I know they're, they're real. Cause so people use me as a source to make sure that they're never getting a fake on those. Cause those are not that difficult to fake. If you look at the design of them, it would be uh, to a, a skilled minter they would be able to create something fairly similar, right? Yeah. So um, being able to attribute the reality of those takes a pro, and then they come to get them from me in bulk because I can source them in bulk, and so then they have some in their shops. They're so cool. They're so yeah. cool. That's one of the coins that I would, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to go hold it, but if it was already hold, imagine how, how cool that would be having a necklace like lined up with those, huh? That's some cool stuff. Oh, sure. And, you know, there's so many of them that it's not as sacrilegious to throw a hold in one of those if you really wanted to. Pretty common. Yeah, there's enough of them, you that's know, okay. and that's, I guess people are going to want a price range on that. Um, $50 for one at the most, you know, and depending on bulk pricing, wholesale pricing or quantity pricing, it can get as low as uh, $35 maybe for a dealer. That's not bad at all. Off. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah, they're totally available. This is, uh, I'm just, I was just thumbing real quick for more coin. Coin juice stuff. Oh, this is, people, this love is juicy. The, people love the min state on the big old crown size things too. I love these right here. So awesome. And there's so many different crown sized, you know, they were just like large silver dollar sized coins of the world. Whenever you see one of these, Joe, mm -hmm. and it has the uh, saltwater damage, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it always means shipwreck, right? Like, what else could that possibly mean? Much, Why are people throwing coins into the ocean? Pretty much, right? guys. I mean, think <laughs> about it. Do you think that, that uh, because you think about the date in the coin, right? In 1779. So you think in 1779, someone could afford to throw that much money just in the water on purpose? Yeah, not really. <laughs> right? Or they were just going to put it in a bowl and wash it with some salt water yeah. and store it in there and just soak it in there for years. Because you don't get that kind of damage from just like a quick brushing. Right. You know what I mean? That takes salt damage <laughs> time. 
It takes time. It takes time spent under the water. So, yeah, um, but you don't pay shipwreck prices without a shipwreck certification. That's the, the lesson for the collectors. Yes, they're shipwreck coins, and it's not wrong to represent them as shipwreck coins, but if you can't tie it to a wreck, specific wreck, you know, pay a little bit more than a, another example. It could be fair, it depends on like when you're selling them out of those. I don't have a certification for those little already embezzled shipwreck uh, necklaces that I showed you there, right. but they're clearly shipwreck coins. They all have salt water damage, the age, the existence of them, but I don't know which shipwreck they're from, right? So I can't, so don't pay the price for that, like in Atocha or, you know, Fliegenhard or some other shipwreck that you're familiar with, because you don't know. You don't know. Let's do a little bit of Ancients for these guys, too. Ancients? Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got so a couple we, Ancients we, collectors out there. We deal in everything, and if you're not already an Ancients collector, I'll see if I can convert you today. Let's get some fun stuff going on. So, what's going to be the most exciting? If you're Christian, let's talk about Trajan. This is the Tribute Penny. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's this all about? No, that's not Trajan. Excuse nope. me, that's not what I'm looking for. Let me correct myself Stand by. before I misspeak. Where's the tribute? Do I have a tribute? This stuff just scares me because it's like I don't know what I'm what I'm doing. You know, there's just yeah, so there's much one I wanted there. to tell a story on, but I'm not sure it's here. Maybe you already sold it, Joe. Yeah, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. I forget I sell it, or someone sold it that was near me. You know, someone else in the in the company who was working here was sold it for me. We got Hadrian. Uh, oh, okay. Here's a where's the Celtic? Got a piece of Celtic gold. It's, here it is. Yeah, that's the one you just picked up. So this is Dru this is Druidic. We're talking Gaelic tribes here. So before the Romans, and that's a horse. That's a horse. That's a, per a rider. Like there's a person riding a horse on that design. It's so cool, isn't it? Yeah. It was two hundred to one hundred BC, guys. Keep track. This is before the Romans made it up to to the, the England, Ireland, and Scotland Wales. And look how gold looks after all that time. It looks like gold to me. It looks like gold. This looks just like gold. But how cool is that? That piece of history. So if you've got that kind of ancestry or descendancy, the chance to find druidic gold, right? Amazing. Like, find, you know, show me some of that somewhere else. Wow. Which store are you going to find that in? This is um, Augustus, also known as Octavian. Oh, Julius Caesar's heir and the first emperor of all Rome. Awesome. And a beautiful piece. Really choice example. Yeah, it came out great. And one thing you'll find about ancients is centering is one of the first things we look at, right? These coins were all hand struck by hammers and dies. And so the, the planchet wouldn't necessarily be lined up right in the middle. In fact, do I need to let you hold this for the best shot on the coin? Let's see. So you want the ancient to be as centered as possible, but you're never gonna get 100%. Oh, you can. Really? Yeah, you can. This coin's particularly well centered as an example. I mean, you got the guy in there, hand striking oh. these, you know, it starts getting close to the five o'clock hour and he's like, you know, I'm just gonna do what I can do. Just, I'm tired, I'm trying yeah. to go back and get some coffee. Yeah. Maybe, maybe see the bar wench, whatever the case may be. Centering. <laughs> <laughs> Centering's kind of like the cack of ancients, right? Yeah. Here's a perfect example of centering. This is a, I'm actually gonna take this out. That's the other thing, guys. People are so, uh, get freaked out by this in, in US, but in ancient coins, you can touch the coin. It's okay, this coin's been touched for a lot of years. How else are you gonna examine the edge? That's one of the reasons why ancient collectors, the advanced ones, they refer to uh, slabs as coffins, mm -hmm. you know, the holders, because they're locking away a coin that's lived forever. This piece isn't that rare. It's uh, an owl, tetradrum from Athens. So this would be like Socrates, Plato, you know, Aristotle, that kind of time period, ancient Greek. That's, this is who's using this coin. Yeah. And a tetradrum is a big piece of silver, so it's no small change. Um, particularly well struck, but what you can see is you've still got original mint luster. Like, just catch the angle on this as I tip, tip, tip it in the light. Yeah, it's beautiful. And all, the original mint luster on a coin that's, what is this, four something BC? Doesn't even seem real that it would yeah. still be there, you know? Yeah, 450, you know, 450 to 400 BC. Now, what's extraordinary about this particular piece, and not ordinary at all, is the full crest. Because typically on one of these, the centering isn't there and you're gonna lose a piece of the design element somewhere. So a full crest Athens tetradrama is one where you've got the very tip of the feathers of the helmet all the way around, even the tail feathers that fly, fall down on the bottom here. You've gotta have all of that without losing the nose. See, it's a full crest, I guess, if you lose the nose, if it's just pushed too far to that side, but it isn't what we mean. It's when awesome. We say full crest piece. Yeah. And a full crest Athens tetradrama is gonna cost you twice as much as one that isn't. 
And we're talking in the $3,000 range for this particular piece. But you could find an uncirculated Athens Tetradrom or nearly Unc. I guess this one would be slightly, you know, AU maybe. Um, you could find an AU or an Unc one of these for more like $1,000, but it won't be this attractive. Gotcha. Yeah. And this one was how much? Three. 3,000. 3,000, yeah. 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 But that's an attractive and, one. And just to let you know, I'm always on the hunt for these, and I sometimes can find, I don't know, I guess I'd say four to 10 a year might cross my path of full crest like among all the dealers that that's I talk it. to in cases that I look like, yeah, it's wow. not that often. I mean, I'm not scouring every auction. So maybe if someone were hunting with this only in mind, they'd be able to run across 15 a year if they're really good, mm -hmm. you know? But like, you're not gonna get that many opportunities to buy a piece like that either. Crazy. What Some people like there? Yeah. Cobb. I this saw is that Bolivian in. Cobb. So we don't have the date on it. The piece was too destroyed for the date to show up. But we did manage to get the mint mark, and that's a uh, blue. All right, let's talk cob. What is a cob, Joe? So like, the cob was a style of coin that was minted. So when the Spanish uh, discovered the new world, right, or conquered it, whatever you want to say, they set up mints because they wanted all the precious metals out. That's what was already money in Europe and would convey the most power on Spain as a kingdom. So their primary goal, wholesale destruction of the people and the culture, if uh, necessary, for them to get the gold and silver out of the ground. Gotcha. Um, so initially, as there were multiple, there was, there was uh, less than a dozen mints. Uh, I'm not going into a specific lesson on Spanish colonial mints, but there were fewer than 12 in there. Um, you know, they represent the different countries that, you know, we say today when we talk about Spanish colonials. So um, what makes it a cob, this, is, this would be circa 1700s, that makes it a cob is that it was before they had the equipment at the mill, the mints to actually make milled coinage. Gotcha. So it's, you know, where, where, where you're used to, oh, let's show the progression over here. That's so are we to. saying, are we saying, Joe, uh, cob right here too, on you? Yes. Out of bang. Yes, cob, not cob. See the perfect circular nature of this? Yes. Super old, 1761, Mexico, Spanish colonial. This is called a pillar dollar. I love a good pillar dollar. Super popular piece, especially in high grade like this, pillar dollar. The pillar dollars then evolved into portraits, but these are already milled coinage. They are perfectly circular. So pre that, when they were misshapen, because the way you'd make this piece, or the way they would make this piece is they would create strips of silver, right? And then they would cut the, or then they would stamp and cut you know, they'd stamp the piece. They didn't care if the whole thing got on there. Usually it didn't. And then they would cut it to make it weigh properly. So you'd have a stamp, you know, certifying the assayer, like who was the one swearing that this was the purity level of it and it was correct and that the weight of it was correct. And then you'd have the mint that it came from and the year that it was made um, so that we could, you know, identify the coin. Um, but then it was cut. Then they would just say like, how much does this weigh? Up, oh, it's a little heavy, snip. <laughs> so, and then it would weigh right, and I'd say, good, next. Good enough. And then the next one. So, <laughs> cobs come in all kinds of varieties, and what makes this particular one so exciting is that the date, 1715, which they weren't all dated, just because they went in that wreck, but the 1715's in there, this one has actually got the date clear as day right there. Right. Right there for you to flex with that. It's a big deal. Yeah. Big yeah, it's deal. That's pretty awesome. This is a big deal, too, though. I mean, the Pillar Dollars has a, has a huge spot in, like, even, like, U.S. collectors, like, loves, I mean, for, for coins. Um, this is like considered like America's really kind of first coin, you know, because they had to use whatever they had when yeah. America was starting. Yeah, that's and the this first was trade it. dollar, the first international <laughs> trade dollar, man. In fact, the word dollar is the, um, it came from the Dutch because they had dollars and dollars over in uh, Europe. So when they saw these big round coins from Mexico, they didn't call them eight reals, that wouldn't have made any sense to them. So they just referred to them by the crown size coins that they were familiar with from back home. And that's, you know, how it is that the vernacular in America became evolved from taller to dollar. And they were originally referring to these because yep. the U.S. didn't already have its own dollars. No, no, we're, we're a bunch of thieves over here in the U.S. We just take everybody yeah. else's ideas. So this was the first <laughs> U.S. dollar that we would trade around or this type and, and the portrait types too. And whatever we could find that was this purity, size, weight and shape. Yep. Those are dollars. Right yeah, so if we continue on here with more more world stuff. We've got more. Oh, there's so much more. There's a, here's a stack of stuff. I, I just I ran out of room in the boxes, so this was just in a rubber band. 78 cc trade dollar, guys. Whoo wee. It's kind of fun. Now these are rough, right? You want to stay with like somebody reputable like uh, Joe here because 
man, people have fakes of these all the time. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times, you know, people won't want to deal in necessarily damaged coins or problem coins. But, man, for some scarce states and expensive pieces, you got to get a problem. You have to make an exception. You're looking yeah. for one with a hole because you could never afford it otherwise. Yeah. And you still want to have one, right? Yeah. So I don't, I don't begrudge a coin that's had some, some history to it. Like for me, like pillar dollars, hold ones, uh, saltwater damage, whatever the case may be. I love pillar dollars. I'll get the damaged ones. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'll save myself some money. Oh, I didn't, even, I didn't even know if we highlighted the error trays over there, but here's a weird error. Okay, let's see this one. How often do you see barber errors? A uh, partial collar strike, huh? Yeah. You'd never see barber errors. Yeah. I mean, you don't usually see barbers in this good of condition either. Right. And it's an error. But like, there's, you know, people who collect errors are used to collecting like, you know, Lincoln cents. Like, right. that's where you see a lot of mistakes made, right? Or so many hundreds of millions produced that there's mistakes, right? How neat is that, huh? Yeah. And, and it's in such great condition. Sure, I know that there's guys that focus just on sample slabs, so we always try to keep samples in stock, because that's a popular thing today. And what is the sample? A uh, sample is when a grading house, like these are the new CAC, grade, CAC G grading, uh, when a grading house, you know, essentially is making samples of their work. They're not actual graded coins, you know, made for a customer for a marketplace. Usually they were given away at an event or these, for example, we're giving away Coinex in St. Louis uh, last year. Yeah, last year. And this was actually, there's actually population reports for CAX sample grading out there, guys. And uh, this is one of the lowest ones that they made. Like they only made so many for each event that they put them out for. So if you want to collect CAC G samples, that's a tough one. Are these pretty pricey? Mm, these are a little more than others. Yeah, this, these guys, I've got them out at 175. That's not too bad. No, this guy's 135. For the guy that's a sample collector. I mean, yeah, one, 135 for either of those, that sort of thing. Um, the There's a, quite a price tag on this guy, though. He's over $2,000. It's it's so cool, though. Yeah. I mean, you got the condition, which is amazing to me, yes. alone, and then the error. Wow. Yes. Yes, and sometimes it's just a really key date. Really simple. Nothing else going on. Just, oh, yeah. Just I a need, little 1861. I, I need that date. Yeah. What's the, what, what are we talking there? Thousand bucks, maybe less. I'd probably discount it. Isn't that wild? Yeah. And it just seems like just a basic holder, just a basic, you know, low grade, you know, no big deal. Yeah, like you could see this in someone's case, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you just feel like, oh yeah, I could you just glance, I glance over it, right? Mm -hmm. You look right past it, and that's yeah. a thousand dollar coin staring up at you. Wow. And we also like to do modern stuff too. Like this is a, a US silver dollar modern commemorative, but they did a program um, back in 1992 where ICG had Nolan Ryan do some signatures. So this is actually signed by him. And, uh, Nolan Ryan, the heat, man. I Ooh. got this out at 275, but it's really cool. I got a signed coin. That is and awesome. It's a US coin. So it kind of, it crosses over into sports memorabilia. And Nolan Ryan to sign it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got some bullies. Who's this guy? Who's this Jeez. guy? This guy, yeah, see, you, know, you love him or hate him. He sells coins. This is um, wanted for president. Well, I think you said it, Joe, is, is love him or hate him. He, I put him on silver. Uh, man, that stuff sells. It like moves. Crazy. It yeah, moves. Yeah. Although, to be fair, the little bit of silver that I've seen with Biden on it has sold very well, too. Really? Yeah. There's only been a little bit of it, and it's usually ridiculing. Oh. So I think it's still selling. <laughs> I think it's selling to the same customer. Like, there's a Looney Tunes one, keep your eye out for, that shows yeah. Biden on it with a Looney Tunes sort of a wow. theme around it. But there's, yeah, there's political stuff is just still for sale, man. Like I said, I don't, I don't censor my store to accommodate people's feelings uh, much. Maybe I'll do it a little bit by not displaying overtly that, which I know really hurts. Um, but that's about as far as I can go. Yeah. And not, because I, I have to continue to serve other people. I'm here to help you find what you're looking for. If what you're looking for isn't popular, I'll still help you. What do they say, Joe? Everybody doesn't like something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't make everybody happy. Yeah. Let's see. Another MacArthur in there, okay. Well, a couple of them, geez. Oh, yeah, that's something I like to keep a lot of in stock because they're a really popular U.S. world crossover. Yeah. You know, when people really love U.S. coins and they're ready to start looking at the world, well, they're, like, looking for the coins that the U.S. made for other countries. Well, it's close to, like, our commemoratives. I mean, it's the half dollar size. I mean, it's, it's right there. Well, sure, and they were struck in our mints in San Francisco. Yeah. So, you know, we struck coins on behalf of other countries many times. Cuban, too. Um, so, you know, that's just, that's where people who want to cross over into world sometimes like to begin. Uh, so I keep a lot of those in stock just because they're a, they're a, they're a popular one. Oh, Lundy. 
Let's talk about Lundy for a minute. This okay. is a really fun story that most people have never heard. All right, we're gonna highlight these guys at the top row. Okay, okay. What, what do we got going on here? Okay, so what we got going on here is Martin Coles Harmon was, uh, he owned an island in the air near the English Channel, right off the coast of England, that, that's um, called Lundy. And he declared himself king and sovereign ruler of his island and then minted coins. <laughs> and it did not make the crown very happy. He did that in 1929. This is an example of an original piece from 1929 that he struck. And they were in two denominations, the puffin and the half puffin. Look at that, the old puffin. Um, and you know, he got in a lot of trouble for that. But ultimately in 1965, some fans restruck the series in multiple medals as fantasy pieces again. So you've got 1965, <laughs> and you've got it in nickel brass, bronze, nickel brass, and bronze for both the half and the whole puffins. How cool is that, huh? Yeah, and really, someone would want to buy this as a group. I, I, and I suppose I'd break it up. I don't, I don't but I, I, would, I, would, I would recommend, I would counsel that someone just take them all because you, you have, what, I, what it's missing is actually the 1925-29 full puffin. Because then you would have the half and the full from 29, and then the half and the full in two different medals from 65. Cute little puffin. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're fun pieces. That's, they're, a, that's way different. I mean, that's Yeah, cool. just stuff that, you know, it's a fun story. Like, this guy just dared to call himself king. I and, mean, like, who doesn't want to be king of their own, like, island, yeah. right? And this particular piece right here, this 3000 vintage, by the way, is the finest graded one. Period. Period. Finest known. Of this particular one. So while the rest of them were priced at $100 individually, this one's at $750 or best offer by itself. It's amazing. It's pretty, pretty big. Absolutely amazing. And it's a, it's a fun piece. Another thing you're just not going to find in other coin stores. Something different, too. Yeah. It's one of those things, like, without the story, Joe, you're mm -hmm. going to glaze over it. You're yeah. not going to think about it, right? But once you know the story, now you're kind of like, you know what? I kind of wouldn't mind having that. Well, I think <laughs> that's kind of our competitive edge here is that I get to, you know, if you get to know me, I'm going to teach you. You know, I can't, I, I, most of my world and ancient collectors had to get trained along the way. You know, there's a, plenty of them that came that were older and they've been in this business a long time or this hobby a long time. And so they um, already love world. But some of the best world customers I have are U.S. dealers. Wow. Because you get bored. Yeah. If you really learn all the stuff in U.S., then what? Where's your game? What are you well, there's, do there's beauty everywhere. I mean, yeah. to say you only like one thing, I, I was a victim of that for a while too. I started branching out. I mean, you got to. And we don't, we don't, not, we don't deny people the stuff that they can find at every other shop too. You know, Brown Ikes and proof sets and prestige sets and what we got here. And these are great for all level collectors. Yeah, these are. Yeah. This is like you want to start with US. You know, you don't know what you love, so you know you look at an example, something like this with a beautiful display box, and it has a certificate in there, and it was made by the US, and that lovely picture and. You know, it's about the March of Dimes, which you might have a personal connection to in your life. There's all sorts of people who benefited from that charity over many, many decades. Um, so, you know, there's crossover. Yeah. A lot of the stuff has crossover. Like, you might love it because of something more than just that you're a coin collector. Right on. Yeah. Joe, I'm going to stop you for a second. Um, yeah. We're at about uh, a little bit over an hour right now. Do you want to do the longest interview video that I've ever done for a coin shop owner? Oh, how long does that take? I mean, we've already made it, to be honest with you. Oh, we're already the longest one ever. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then let's, yeah. Then I think I've done well over well, 100 now, but. Well, here's the thing now. The longer that we go from here, the harder the record will be to break again. Yeah. Let's so, see if the phone can handle it. I, I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm not scared. I'll keep okay. going. But I don't, I don't, we're actually getting low. So we had 61 feet of showcase space, guys, and we've gotten through about 48. We still got to do bullion. Yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> we got time to go. We still got some cases All to right, go. Cool. So really simple, fun set. The U.S. dollar story, Morgan, Peace, Sacagawea, Eisenhower, even a silver certificate in there. You know, not an expensive piece, 75 bucks. That stuff's trade. great for the wall. Yeah. Yeah, hang it up and enjoy that. I'm so guilty of that, too. I got the wall stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I've been doing is I've decided to keep our walls bare until we get numismatic only stuff. Okay. It's either got to pay homage to that, like that example over behind you. That way Where we is... At? Not, they're not real bills, guys. If you get real close, you'll see they're oversized. They're just a production for display. Okay. Right? But they're a beautiful example of those notes, just blown up a little bit. And then you got Pac-Man and 
And you yeah, got well, because Ninja you know, Turtles. There's, there's crossover. <laughs> the, co- the not coin things get relegated to the back corner because they still have to go away. But this sort of thing absolutely will make our walls. You know, and it's for sale. I've got this price down to $350 right now. So there's all kinds of options there. And on that wall, this is coming soon. Remember, we're two weeks in now. On that wall over there, we're going to have a bid board. And that, I think, creates the greatest transparency in the business. I call it a bid board. That actually means other things to other people. But essentially, it's going to say what, we're, what our bid and ask is on all the most common bullion items and things that are heavily traded. Right? So people come in the door and they just know right off the they bat. They look up and they'll say, okay, right now that they're paying plus one for Silver Eagles and they're charging with plus four. Yeah. You know, well, that's that, important too because yeah. typically that stuff never has prices on it. You know, and so everybody's kind of they're afraid to ask, like, hey, you know, like, what's what do you charge it for silver today? And that stuff is so they're so commodity like. You know, I don't actually really get to set the prices. I'm at the whims of the markets on those things. And so anything that isn't you know numismatic enough for me to be the one saying how much it costs, that's that's where I have to just put the prices out there for everybody because I can only get eagles for the price I can get them from in the market that day at that yeah. time. It is what it is. And I have to sell them for what I have to sell them for. We all saw that in a few months ago when the premiums were well over $10 in both directions. And that was like nuts, but it happens. And when that happens, you'd see my prices rise just along everybody else's. Right. Yeah. Premiums are better now, man. It's a buying opportunity, I think, for bullion. I, absolutely. I agree. And I still think that, you know, silver and gold are cheap here. I know that there's people that are scared. I mean, I think it is. 1936 Prestige Tribute set. Worldwide. Yeah. Look at that. Copies. Copies, huh? Copies, copies. 36 proof set, tough. 36 prestige set, I think there was like a thousand of these made. But they're still beautiful, like that's the example of that. That's awesome. And they're scarce, but just so you know, they're copies. And that's why they're in a case here that's got more tokens and things in it. And <clears throat> I have the opportunity to represent that. And, and actually, like a good copy, like this is also copy, guys, not the real thing. The real thing's in the Smithsonian. <laughs> right. But it's beautiful, <laughs> and you'll never own the real thing. So if you want a beautiful thing as if you did, you buy the copy. Yeah. But copies are well marked. You see, that's why right. I'm happy to sell this. No, no problems because yeah. it's not a counterfeit. It not says counterfeit. copyright on the coin. Hundred percent. Yep, I get it. <clears throat> so I got some of the new uh, Morgans and Peace dollars. Yeah, we got all the stuff. I mean, these are the things that people want. You know, when, the, when things, are, new products from the mint for that year, then we gotta have them. We gotta have 2024 Eagles and anything released in 2023 or 2024 that people are still hunting for. Wiki graded Eagles too. I mean, I have sacks of. Kennedys and Eisenhowers and Sacagaweas and, you know, because while they're, they don't mean a lot to a lot of, you know, serious collectors out there, if someone's putting together a, a BU Kennedy half set and they want to go all the way up to today, it's really hard to find some of those pieces. Yep. You know, you want to find a 1983 in BU condition, like, where? Where were they preserved? They're not silver, right? So why would they have been preserved or where would they be preserved like that? So they have been preserved and I... I have unks out here, but I, I don't actually have the time to sort those things and to actually like, so they're in the sack. And if you, if you come looking for BU Kennedys for me that are clad, I'm just going to let you do pull what you want and then we'll figure it out. So you've got like silver shark teeth over here. Yeah, so That's this, is a, this is a new artist that we're working with, um, fairly new, I guess he's been a couple of years now on the scene. But like people really love the Prospector coins, right? Prospector angle hearts. So he made a silver piece. This is three nines fine, pure silver, one troy ounce, and it's a prospector. And it's in three dimensions. Who is this artist? Uh, this is uh, AJ, AB Custom, I think he calls himself. Oh, AB Customs? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've caught him over at the uh, fun show a couple times. Yeah, yeah. And he's got, this is one of my favorite pieces and very popular out of our store, is the T-Rex skull. How cool, huh? Yep, and it stands like it's got he's got it flat so that it, it sits up like that And they all come with his cert, you know swearing to the purity and the size and everything's so got that nice packaging on it But that's a silver Megalodon tooth Wow It's got the serrations on and everything Yeah, so we like to just have the, the, the cool, you know, we like to have this stuff if you come into this store You could very well spend hours here um, and you could spend tens of thousands if you have it. You know, if you have it to spend, you, could, you wouldn't run out of places to spend your money. Well, that's good times. I mean, if you've got a hundred bucks to your name, you're going to walk out with a handful of stuff if you want, or one beautiful thing, but you're still going to have a great time. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We have trays like this, you know, two dollar trays, you know, mint state, Sacagaweas, and other dollar coins, because sometimes people are looking for 
certain presidents and the presidential dollars. And while it's not something that I consider that numismatic because it's still all spending money, if it's uncirculated, we'll throw a $2 price on it and put it out in the dish. And if someone pulls enough of those things, I'd probably discount anyway, right? Because they're still just a buck. But cool. they're a little bit better, so. Do a little advertising over here. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we did some advertising in a local publication. Good for you. And uh, yeah, we do, we're, we're promoting ourselves in a lot of places, guys. Let's welcome to the bullion cases. Uh, again, we have much, much more in the safes. This is the display, right? So this is just giving examples of not quantities available. Beautiful stuff here. And a little bit numismatic, but I'm keeping the gold kind of, you know, over here and away from the rest of the stuff. You ever get tired of holding those 100 ounce bars? Yes, I set them down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> But if you mean holding in the sense of keeping possession and keeping secure, <laughs> then no, no problem holding them. But if I'm actually gonna hold them in my arms, oh, look at that, that Tampa Bay Devil Rays inaugural game proof set. 250 of them made, man. Oh, that's gotta be big over here for Florida. Huge. We're close huge. to the Rays. The inaugural, the very first game. They don't call them the Devil Rays no more. Just the Rays that's now. That's right. That's right. That's that cool. right there came out on the day of game one. Somebody here locally is gonna definitely grab that. Oh yeah. But hey, listen, you know, depends on how fast they see this video. <laughs> you know, call me on anything just in case. Take a shot, guys. So these are pours. I do a lot of pours stuff, not just AJ stuff. This is, uh, I think, one of the best. This is Locker. I'm a big fan of Locker, man. I'll give him a shout out. Um, I think this is one of the most beautiful precision pours I've seen. And I don't think I've ever told him that personally. So here you go. My acknowledgement. 140 of these in existence. Nefertiti, and it's a pour, guys. Yeah, and like I think that three and a half ounces, and it could you 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 could think that was struck. It's so well done because he does sand casting, and then like AB will do like lost wax. So it's a different art, but to get this right here in this condition, sand casting, it is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. I mean, just look at the the, the thinner, the smaller details right here, and the striations on the pyramids, even in the sand like that. The the the, the, the on the wings. Look at the wings. Beautiful. Look right there, all those little lines right there. I mean, that's. That's precision, guys. He calls it precision pours, and he's not kidding. Do you have any um, spectacular hand pours? I didn't see any of his stuff. <laughs> I didn't. That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. I don't, but I have time. a feeling that we're opening up a new line here. There's time. And that there'll be, a ch <laughs> there'll be the opportunity for me There's to do time. that. There's time. How about a two-ounce skateboard? That's cool, right? Fingerboard right there. Those little tech deck things that everybody was addicted to in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number 66, three nines fine silver poured. That's beautiful. Isn't that fun? Everything, well done, huh? They all come with certs, well-made stuff. I, this is a personal favorite of mine, <clears throat> but I was of that generation. 500 of these original Nintendo controllers were made in two ounces of fine silver. Me too, that was my first system right there. Yeah, yeah, that was it, it's the one I grew up on. So to see that only 500 of these existed, I had a lot of the original mintage because I was a fan of the guy that minted them, but I, uh, I've been selling them for years now. Who minted those ones? They're almost gone. Um, who poured these for me? It was like, I got them through Rogue's Island. So if you guys don't know Rogue's Island Mint, uh, they're wholesale only though. So if you're a dealer, look for them. If you're uh, uh, not a dealer, come find me. I'll help you get anything that they've, they've done. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who he had to do that for him. I love the pours. I, I think it's so yeah. cool. It's like a, you know, it's an art form. It sure. really is. And that's where I get into the carvings too, right? Because it's like when you can find art with any of this. And coins are inherently art, but that's why we give you know, so much credit to the um, sculptors who make the dyes, right? So even, you know, we, we, why do we give so much acknowledgement to, the, to, to Fraser and to St. Uh, Gaudens and to Barber and Morgan? Because those guys were artists that Absolutely. created iconic pieces. Mm -hmm. And we like looking at those pieces to this day, so those artists deserve acknowledgement. I mean, think about this as an artist, like, gosh, other than coins, how could your art be reproduced that many times? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, think about that from Morgan's perspective. Like, how many millions of mm -hmm. copies of his artwork have passed around and been used as money? I mean, that's, that's almost as thrilling as being the king on the coin. Yeah. You know, because throughout most of human history, you were only on a coin if you were the king, a ruler, the emperor, somebody. Like, you were the, the man. Yep. Whoever you were, if you were a woman, you were the woman. And there were <laughs> women. We have Cleopatra over there on ancient coinage. Cleopatra is really hard to find. And some of these coins, I mean, they were they minted out in the billions, and they're in everybody's home in America. And technically, you have that person's artwork in your house. I mean, if exactly. you want to think of it that way, sure. Exactly. And yeah. so here's a fun example. So people get into gold, and they buy a lot of eagles, and sometimes they get into maples. But, you know. I like gold, but man, it's expensive. 
Right, so this is one of the reasons I carry tents, because you know, you're, you're paying a bigger premium, absolutely, and if you can afford to buy ounces at a time, I always recommend that. Um, but if you can't, you wanna buy the kind of fractional gold that will retain premium value. You know, the kind that like, you know, if you pay more than, you have to pay more than gold, more than spot, right? So that you want something that maybe you'll get more than spot when you go to sell it later. Are you gonna do that with the tents, you think? Are you gonna get more than spot back? Oh, for sure. Right now, we have bid prices on uh, tents right now, and I think our bid is plus 4% on those. Okay. You know, we're paying over on Eagle, we're playing plus 1% plus right now on Silver Eagles. Um, we're at spot on Gold Eagles at the moment. We are at uh, plus 4, I think, on the tents, plus 3 on the quarters, plus 2 in the halves. You know, so we're paying up for fractional gold because we expect you know the customers have to pay up for it too right those prices change all the time i want everybody to know that so when joe's saying that right now um you know a year from now if you're still watching this video a week from now yeah it, that could definitely change so right. don't call and be mad at joe if those prices are different that's just the way the markets work but do call and find out what the prices are 100 like what they are in the moment because whatever i quote you is in that moment right so how can they do that joe how can they find your phone number Right there. there on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, right there in yeah. the in the description area. I mean, I mean we're we're searchable guys. We're Bean Town Coins, and if you Google Bean Town Coins, you find me. There's yeah. no one else to find. I'm it. This what's is, what's some more things you got? You got the Instagram. Sure, we're on Instagram as uh, Bean Town Coins FL. Okay. We are doing whatnot auctions on a regular basis. Newly, brand new guys. We've been doing that less than the two weeks the store's been open. So. Um, we're, we're still getting that off the ground, but if you're a whatnot follower, please go look for us and subscribe or follow or join or whatever they call it on that platform so that you get notified when we do an auction. Um, we're still working out the schedule. We've been doing them during the week, uh, during the day, which doesn't work for our customers, but it's been more convenient for me. Um, I think we're going to have to change that uh, really to serve you guys by moving them to the evenings, um, but we're working on that and we're looking for feedback. So if you're a whatnot user now already and you want to come shop at our auctions, uh, please do reach out to me through any channel and just let me know, you know, what works and what you suggest or what would make a difference for you because I don't have any customer feedback yet from that channel. Good. Very cool. And we also have a YouTube channel that we're just beginning. There's no content up there yet, but we'll be able to drive people there off of this video shortly. Um, and we're also really open to, to new TikTok. We've had Instagram for a while, so if you're not already following us on Instagram, we've got like, you know, I don't know, well over a thousand followers. Um, Bean Town Coins FL. You're just a jack of all social media trade, huh? I mean, wow. you know, I have no skill in that stuff whatsoever. <laughs> and I've, it's in fact, it's gone so slow like this because I've gotten people to help me, and I've been yeah. at the whims of their abilities or timing. But now that I have, we hired a new social media manager and numismatist, um, and he's uh, 20 years old. Just to give you guys an example, there are opportunities for young people. He happens to live nearby. Big fan. Um, he got the job in uh, large part because his skill with world and ancients is beyond what you typically find in, you know, people much older. That's amazing. And in addition to that, he had enough wherewithal with the social media that I could hand him all the stuff that I struggle with. And it's not a struggle just that I'm old. I can learn anything if I put my time into it. But think about this. Do you guys want me to put my time into learning how to operate social media? Or do you want me to continue to put my time into developing this coin store for you, you know, <laughs> yeah. and getting you the best quality stuff and educating myself so that I know more because I have to learn. I do so much continuing business education. You know, I, when I started in this business, it was only 15 years ago. I didn't know what a, world, a US, what a rare coin was. I didn't know what coin collecting was 15 years ago. And all of the knowledge that I've gained in that 15 years is because I'm an avid seeker of it. You know, and even now I'm up at night reading and studying and learning and, and not just the coins, but the history that's tied to the coins. So I can tell the stories so you guys can hear the stories and then you can buy the coin and tell the stories yourself. That's great, Joe. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And so I recommend to people for, for, for bullion, if you're going to get into tents, get something more exotic. Like Spain has only recently starting out putting out gold. I think they're only like, what, two or three coins in? Yeah, they're three in now. Boom. And this is the bull, that's the lynx, the stallion's next. So there's, there's, you know. And it's got some, some ties to some of the historic coins that we saw, right? Like the yeah, pillar. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and similar to equal pricing, you should expect to pay something like, you know, 13, 14, 15% over for fractional. But you'll get three, four, or 5% over for it when you sell it if you're selling it to the right place. Gotcha. You know, so it's pretty, very yeah, pretty. Yeah, and the spreads are much tighter on larger denomination stuff. So if you're buying gold um, as an investment, as a hedge against inflation, as protection for the end of the US dollar, um, then obviously I recommend people buy one ounce at a time. 
you know, as many of them as you can afford, but don't go smaller than an ounce because you're paying for fractionality you don't necessarily need. But just remember, if you're stacking bullion as an end of days kind of guy and you're a survivalist, you're not gonna be able to make change for bread with gold, right? So you gotta have silver then. Gotta have it. You know, and I tell people that are, that are preppers to buy a lot of uh, US 90% dimes because in an apocalypse, they'd still be recognized, known for their silver content. They're small, they're durable because they're 90% and 99, and you know, they're they're just they're small enough to make change for. Like you carry you know. the 90% silver? Oh sure, sure we do. I don't display it because you know, who, where's the fun in that? We only have so much space out here, and you guys all know what it looks like. Yeah. But if someone comes in to order, we just reach out and call. You've got it, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And and we do you know all the other stuff that you expect from a coin store, and then and then some. Here's a fun error. Where's the fun error? There he is. Check this out. You know, I saw that. Yeah. It's wild looking. Yeah, this is a one ounce generic silver buffalo. People are familiar with that, right? That has know. another one ounce generic silver buffalo stretched over it. How did that happen? Can I touch that? I have no idea in the well, maintaining process. Heavy too. It's two ounces. It's yeah. exactly two ounces because it's one coin stretched and pulled over another. How weird, huh? Isn't that funny? I, I, like how this happened, I'm not so sure, but you can see the lines that were the ribbing. Jeez. You see that? I mean, maybe someone just put it in a press after the fact. I don't know that this was mint made, to see if they not could do mint it. made, to see if they could do it, mm -hmm. but it is exactly two ounces of fine silver, and it is exactly what it appears. You see that reading? Yeah. Like the good. reeded edge there? That's wild. So it was somehow pulled over and encased around. Yeah, like a break a machine, huh? <laughs> right? I don't know what the hell this thing is, uh, but, but like, find me another. What does that cost? Uh, I got it out of 250, but it's negotiable. It's two yeah. ounces of silver and it's the coolest thing, you know, like. It's just... literally one of a kind. You'll never see yeah, that again. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and that's what I love to have one of a kind things because that's what I want people to see when they come into my store. Like, you know, what's our competitive edge? You feel there's coin stores all over America, but it's worth flying to St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, really if you're, if stuff, you're yeah. a real collector, you can afford a plane ticket as easily as you can afford an expensive coin. So. You know, this is a call, really, to anybody out there who's just not getting served wherever they are. If it's inside of your wheelhouse, your budget for time and money, come to St. Petersburg, I'll take care of you. You know, if you're coming for a mission, call me ahead of time so that you make sure that there's no conflicts going on here and that I can accommodate what you're looking for. And I can, might even, you know, stock more of your jam before you come in. Right on. Give Joe a call. Make sure you check out his social media platforms. Uh, at the very least, please give, give a little thumbs up and some comments some of, of love down here for Joe because he's taking a lot of time out of his schedule to come and do this with me. So I'm here on a Sunday for you guys. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I love <laughs> really it. appreciate it, man. I am, and we've reached the last case here. This is the wall. This is the wall. And so what have we got here? Oh, so in this case, it's just more specialty bullion though. This is the stuff that's like at a premium. It's not, it's not like an Eagle, you know, spot plus three or five or whatever. This is the stuff that's, you know, multiples sometimes. Like here's a one ounce ET colorized in a holder like that, just to give you a sense. And we have some more of this in another part of the store too, but that's $40. So it's not bad. No, it's not, the stuff is still priced appropriately, guys. It's just that it's not a function of spot. Exactly, it's just $40 for that ounce of silver because that ounce of silver, we had to pay rights to Amblin Entertainment and mm -hmm. we had to pay for the packaging and so it has a little more cost to it. But, it works. you know, peanuts. And it, there is about popularity and rarity. Some of these things get really rare, so there's numismatic value in bullion if you're talking about low mintages or scarce examples of a thing, you know, or just super high demand, right? Like if there's 10,000 of a bullion coin made, but there's 100,000 people who want one, that coin's gonna be scarce and it's gonna be expensive. Right on. Even though it was just a simple bullion piece that when it was released was spot plus something. You know, that happens with the elephants sometimes over here, Somalian elephants. Like right now, this year's you can still get for fairly cheap prices online until the mintages are sold. But if you wanna go back to prior years, it starts to be more expensive to get yourself an example because there's more demand for them than there is supply. And the ones that are made, once they were made, they're not made anymore. And people get the newer one and then they realize there was an older one and they're like, oh, I gotta get the older one. <laughs> exactly. And then they want to go back and get those and then it becomes harder to do. So, yeah. but you as a collector could buy that sort of thing. And then in five years, you find that your piece is worth much more than you paid. Regardless of the intrinsic silver values movement, it's in demand and hard to find now. Joe, I just glanced down and I saw something that's, it's created some drama. Okay. You got the drama dragon right here. You know about that? No, tell me about the drama. Oh buddy, that was all kinds of social media, Instagram drama between all the fans of bullion out there, oh, I created some drama. What? So tell me the story. Uh, I, so, I, I get well, to hear a story. You want to bring it out? Let's pull it out. Yeah, I want to hear a story. 
So this was made by a uh, basically a dealer, right? Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful bar. I think it's a hundred gram bar, right? Uh, what does it say on the back there? It says fifty grams. Fifty gram. That's right. Fifty gram bar, uh, made by another dealer from Pam. And there was some drama, like, because it wasn't Pamp's normal product, right? It comes out. It was made by another dealer. And so it's a beautiful bar. I had one myself. I thought it was great. Um, but it was just, people were like, oh, it's confusing because it's not really from Pamp. Somebody paid to have it made. It was, ah, so you know, what we're internet talking about drama. Is, oh, okay. So here, <laughs> let me help with that, guys, because it's called private minting. And we have private minted coins. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about how that works. There are mints out there like the Royal Canadian Mint uh, that will only mint for themselves. They're not going to do it. They might do a custom piece for the right organization, I think, but it's going to be a special situation. They've done it with privy marks, right? They've had certain um, organizations or causes warrant them making a special edition of a thing. But, you know, is that Canadian still? I think so, right? Because yeah. they made it. So PAMP made this. You gotta get that. The manufacturer is at the, the, the process is it was PAMP. Yes. What people are saying is, did the Australian government authorize it or some other government or not? This is not a governmental issue. This is, um, this is made, it's Swiss made because it was made by PAMP in Switzerland, right? Yep. But it was made not as their issue. A private person, company, right. whatever the case Hired may be. Hired them to do that. Did, yes. But what will shock you is how many other pieces that that's true. Oh, it happens all the time. So many of the pieces you already know and love were made by a particular person. I'm talking to Silvertown right now about making me some private pieces. Sure, it yeah. happens that way. <laughs> but if you then get a country to put their effigy on your coin, that coin is now Somalian. Yep. Do you see that? Yep. Was it made in Somalia? Probably not. Probably not. They've probably never seen those before in Somalia. But it is legal tender in Somalia. It sure is. And you would never want to spend it as legal tender because its intrinsic value in silver is worth so much more. Right. But that makes it a coin. And why that matters is because we collect coins and because there are laws regulating import and export tariffs and things like that. So when a piece of, and sales tax, right, and things like that. So when a piece of metal is a coin, it's treated different legally than when a piece of metal is a round or a bar that isn't a coin stamped with an effigy from a country. So a lot of times it's both to make it more desirable for collectors and to skirt import-export issues for us to take a round that would otherwise just be a silver round and get a country to put an effigy on it. And we have to bribe them for that. You know, Nui is the biggest one out there. They just get money. Every single time you see a coin from Nui, it was made by a private uh, other mint who paid Nui to put their effigy on the coin. Now, what's cool is they're all low mintage items. So if years from now you wanted to collect coins from Nui, You'd have a hell of a time. Yeah. There's so many of them and they are Nui coins. So And know. it's so funny, those places are like little tiny islands like Tuvalu, little yeah. tiny islands. They've never seen these pieces, but yeah, yeah there's there's yeah. pieces coming from them. Yes, exactly. I just thought it was great. I thought the drama was hilarious. And, and then it's but, funny, but to address it, like you gotta get that many more things than you realize are done <laughs> that way. Because someone has to it's like Disney said, right? Walt Disney said, like someone had to see this swamp and then see this theme park and then cause that. Yeah. And it's that vision that makes everything happen in the world. And th every coin you've ever seen was someone's vision before it was a coin. For sure. And if the way we do it is the guy who has the ability to produce it with the ma machinery, the equipment, the labor, the skills, etc., meets up with a person with a vision. And the money. And the money to, <laughs> to cause it, because these guys aren't putting their money behind it if you're doing it, you know, you're having them do it. Right. <laughs> And yeah, but I've done that, I recommend it, and I've had people commission, you know, reach out to me to commission an idea that they've had on their hearts for years and they just had no idea how to get a coin made. Yeah. So if you wanna get a coin made, call me. Right on. I'll help you make your own. If you've got a particular piece of artwork or something you wanna pursue, it's just a function of dollars, and if necessary, depends on how many you wanna produce, I'll help you move them too. Right on. And I think uh, one of the last things we'll look at real quick, I think you got some supplies too. In case oh yeah, supplies. we're getting a good coin store. We got all the stuff. And the supplies are actually mostly out there. This is the backup. This is like the overflow. So at the very, very front of the store, under the register is where we keep, you know, all the loose supplies. Somebody says, I need so, tubes. I need flips. I need the books. Oh, yeah. yeah we, got, we got, you know, and we're, we're working on building up our Dan's Ghost selection now because they're pretty much the most popular books. We have Whitman's too. Um, we have them both new and used. Uh, but we're really still building up our dance go inventory because they're really popular and I can't keep as fast as I'm finding them, they're going. Right on. So. Okay. Well, Joe, anything else? 
No, uh, just <laughs> anything that I didn't say or the questions that I left you hanging with. I mean, we kind of covered everything in the longest video you've ever made. For sure, 100%. If people have questions, um, they'll maybe just like leave them there in the comments yeah. or they can call you. I'm Joe at beantowncoins.com. Um, the website inventory is still being uh, adjusted right now. We have, I'm understaffed, so. So calling is best. Calling is best. During but normal you will see hours. stuff online. Don't just order it at this moment, but within a week or two, we'll probably have that all straightened out and you'll see accurate, accurate inventory levels on our website too. Right on. Joe, listen, thank you for your time, man. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it. Thank you, it's a pleasure. I'm gonna do come. business, actually. This is, this is great. I mean, yeah, you got so much stuff. Yeah, come back anytime. Now turn the cameras off so you can uh, have a good time. And I'm going to. Do some trading. <laughs> all right, Joe, thanks so much. Yeah, take care. Bye. All right, what's this coin all about, Joe? So this is another toner here. This is like Northern Lights quality stuff. If you ever heard of the Northern Lights, it was a collection of Lincoln scent toners that was probably the most spectacularly toned Lincoln scents that have hit the marketplace. Would they, would they designate it? It would have been designated if this was in the Northern Lights collection. It's not, I'm just saying it's of the caliber. Yeah. Yeah, it would have, had, it would have had a pedigree on it, but look at that. Like, have you ever seen a Lincoln scent? Wow. It looks like that. Yeah, it's... And that's expensive. This is otherwise a who cares coin, 48D. But with that kind of color on it, this coin is hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I'm sure I have it over a thousand. Let's see, I've got it out of 1425 right now. But it only says one cent on there, man. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is only one cent. In fact, if you've got the right cent, I would trade you one cent for one cent. Really? Which one do you have? You know, when I was a kid, we did this every day in school and I believe we need to bring this back a little bit and I'm gonna start right now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah.